Fridays, we'll be back with more news from Santa Barbara, California, and the West. Welcome to the Arts and Antique Radio Show, where your host, nationally recognized certified appraiser Elizabeth Stewart, Santa Barbara's treasure sleuth, will help you put a value on the treasures in your own home. Every time it rains, it rains, pennies from heaven. Don't you know each cloud contains pennies from heaven? So let's find out. How valuable is it? Three, two, one. You're live. Hello, 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 Santa Barbara. It's your Chantress of Everything Valuable and Beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart. And I'm kind of excited because we have a, a wonderful musician to talk to. Um, but it, this is because one of our favorite chamber music groups is coming back to Santa Barbara and will perform um, at the Santa Barbara Mu Museum of Art at the Mary Craig Auditorium Monday, November 21st at 7 30 p.m and this is the parker quartet and i've got a member actually one of the founder founding members of the parker quartet um to talk with us today is ki kim um and just a little bit bit of background um the parker quartet's based in boston um their honors include the concert arts guild competition the grand prix and mozart prize at the bordeaux international string quartet competition the Chamber Music America's prestigious Cleveland uh, Cleveland Quartet Award, and then of course the Grammy, uh, their Grammy winners, um, 2010 Best Con Best Chamber Group, uh, and so you know the lot of lot of kudos behind the, the group, of course, um, and I'm going to speak a little bit with with Key today. Key is the cellist, and um, oh. there is there's Key. And then he's on the faculty at Harvard University's Department of Music. Uh, like I said, he's a founding member of the Parker Quartet and the Blodgett Artist in Residence at Harvard since 2014. Um, and we all we mentioned that you know, this was a 2010 Grammy Award for the Best Chamber Music Performance. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit with Mr. Kim. I want to know, Keith, the, the, the cello that you play on is a fairly famous cello. What's that like? I mean, tell us a little bit about your, your baby. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to play on this cello since 2004. And it's an old Italian cello, not the oldest out there, but it's a cello that was made by the Italian maker in Milan, Giacomo Rivolta, in, uh, let's see, 1844. Um, it's the last cello that he made, and it has sort of those golden that sort of golden Italian sound. And um, yeah, it's it's a high maintenance instrument, but I've been blessed to play on it and to create beauty on it for some time now. When you say high maintenance, what does that mean exactly? Uh, maybe because it's older, I feel like it uh, just takes, it, it takes more maintenance to maintain the integrity of the instrument. Um, I feel that it's very fickle. If I haven't played on it in a while, then um, it won't just give me a beautiful sound. I have to, it makes me work for it again. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, and it, it's very susceptible to climate changes in the, in the temperature and, um, and in dryness in the atmosphere and, and humidity and stuff like that too. So. I see. And the bow you play with is also pretty exceptional, is it not? Yes. It's made by, uh, a great, um, he lives in Boston now, but he's a French man named Benoit Roland. Um, and back in 2005 or six or one of those years, um, the quartet, when Benoit moved to Boston, we were fortunate enough to meet with him and ask him to uh, create a quartet of bows for all of us, for the four of us. Um, and so we all own Benoit Roland bows, uh, which we've been very, very fortunate to play on. And I also want to mention that um, there, you have a new EMI release, I believe. Um, and I was trying to pronounce the um, mm -hmm. the title. And uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the release. Um, it's it, There's a big press release about it, the e ECM, sorry, the ECM new series. 
Um, and mm -hmm. one of the members is saying, this is by far the most personal recording we have made. And it, it uh, uh, the history of this recording goes way back to your your years as students in the conservatory, I understand. So it's this, yes, can you yes. just, yeah, tell us a little bit about this, this uh, recording. Sure, so we paired um, Georges Kurtag, a Hungarian composer who's still alive today, um, uh, as well as a viola quintet with one of our mentors from our conservatory days, um, Kim Kashkashan, uh, in Dvorak's viola quintet, Opus 97. Um, and the connection there is really a, a very personal one. Um, Kurtag has been sort of very present in our lives since at least 2005, I believe. Um, when we entered the Bordeaux International String Court uh, competition, his piece was one of the compulsory new pieces uh, for that competition. And he composed the Cis Moment Musico for that competition. And so we learned it um, then, but fortunately we, uh, Kim, Kashkashian, who I mentioned was one of our mentors at the conservatory and who are violists in the quartet study with, she has a great working relationship with Kurtag and um, performed many, many of his works. Um, and so we were playing for her and she's like, I know Kurtag, I can, you know, why don't we work on this piece together? And I, I remember um, it wasn't even published yet. We were working off handwritten manuscripts and um, so we would play for Kim and she would make all these notes and then send it via fax to Georges Courtag. And he would, you know, write over those notes with a red pen and send it back and say, I want it like this and, and I want that. And it, it really seemed like we were part of the creative process, which was really quite a uh, heady experience. Um, and so when we were given this opportunity to record for this label, uh, ECM, uh, immediately our thought went to um, recording Kurtag, music of Kurtag, and also uh, as someone who was so instrumental in bringing this music and his language to life for us with Kim, um, it, it just sort of was a natural evolution to record the Dvorak viola quintet with Kim. So uh, again, there's no not really a sort of thematic or even musical thread between Kurtag and Dvorak, but uh, more of a personal, personal one for us. Um, and Kim also has a very close working relationship with the ECM label as well. So it's just sort of a whole holistic kind of experience for all of us. How cool is that? That, um, that just the, you know, the, the old days where we were faxing back and forth in regards to, you know, the, you're faxing with the composer who's presumably in, in his native country, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you're doing this, but, but I understand that the quartet has a, has a deep, commitment to um you know to creative process and i i know yes. you guys work with a lot of composers of today and you collaborate with a lot of ranges of artists different types of artists um, and then i also want want you to just mention to our listeners the beethoven project that seems to be huh? such an interesting project here again it's a co co, co collaboration mm -hmm. That's the sure. 20th, uh, 20th anniversary of your project. Uh, yes, uh, 2023, uh, 2022, I guess we're in. Um, we're celebrating um, our 20th anniversary as a quartet. We formed in 2002. Um, and so we wanted to mark this milestone by... Um, one of the ways we wanted to mark this milestone was to perform a complete Beethoven cycle. Uh, many of you know that Beethoven composed 16 string quartets that range um, uh, sort of throughout his entire lifespan. Uh, and we categorize them as early, middle, and late period quartets. Um, it really traced the evolution of his, of his creative genius and his writing. Uh, and so we wanted to perform the entire cycle. We've, only, we've had only done the half, half of the cycle before. Um, and... But, you know, it's now it's no longer, you know, so such a feat of, you know, because everybody has done it. Um, of course, it's such a milestone to play the entire 16 quartets in 
you know, one in a series of concerts. Um, but we wanted to add even more significance, personal significance to it and uh, created it and it's become a really sort of multifaceted project. In addition to the performance of the cycle, which we're doing twice um, in two different settings in March, um, other elements of it include uh, a, a what we're calling Beethoven Illuminated, which is a series a video archive which illuminates each Beethoven quartet. Um, and they've already, the first two or three have already been released on YouTube and you can check it out on our YouTube page. Um, and it just talks about what makes each Beethoven quartet special and um, all of us uh, had a hand in writing the script for it. And we just talk about why we enjoy it, what makes it special, um, what makes it special for us as performers and stuff like that. I, I also, I also know, it, Kia, it's, it, what is also interesting is that, you know, you mentioned that you're doing the complete cycle in two separate locations. Um, and yes. so what, what would those locations be? And then also part of what fascinated me about the Beethoven project is that you're bringing mm -hmm. Beethoven's music to non-traditional places. And it mentioned, homeless mm -hmm. shelters and youth programs. And so I wonder, you know, where that first question, where are you doing the two complete cycles? And then mm -hmm. what are you, are you doing anything in regards to the Beethoven project in, you know, non-traditional locations? Sure. So uh, to answer your first question, we're performing it in two separate, uh, not venues, but locations. Uh, the first at the beginning of March is at the University of Buffalo. And they have um, what they call the Slee series. And the Slee series has been presenting the complete Beethoven cycle every year for, I don't know, for a long time. Um, and it's, uh, and sometimes they have one quartet doing the entire cycle. Sometimes they have two quartets doing half of it or, you know, any sort of combination. Um, but it's really a, a gift to that community to sort of be presented with these uh this Beethoven cycle every year and so, so we'll can, can you hold that thought one second Richard's giving us a sign we got to go a quick break so that's in sure. Buffalo New York how cool mm -hmm. is that and then when we get back from the break I want to know you know where else you bring Beethoven I think that would be sure. fascinating hey Richard there we go okay yes so, I'm here Elizabeth there we go. and did you did you by any chance get the music I sent the, I did we'll be hearing okay, so, just a couple so of dear Lister, you're going to hear he and his fellow quartetters from Parker Quartet play a little bit I don't know what order this is going to be in because <laughs> well we'll see we'll see Kia will tell us when we get back from the break don't turn that down back with Parker Quartet all right you're clear And your uh, set next guest, Penny Little Samson Clinic. We're there at the beginning. And all the little and big steps along the way. 200 physicians for your every need. A healthcare system where all profits go back into our community's health. Your health. Your doctors. Your healthcare system. Your health. Your doctors. Your healthcare system. Hey, Richard, there you go. Okay, great. Uh, your other Thanks. guest is in the waiting room. You want me to bring her in? No, not yet. No. So, okay. Um, no. Yeah, I think right right at 1030, we can we can shuffle a uh, shuffle around um, with that. Mm -hmm. So what was that? Was that the, the that, that's that's the music that I was having a little bit trying to wrap my head around what that is and how, sure. how to best understand it. But it was a marvelous performance. I mean, I enjoyed it. It's just like it wasn't what I expected. I was expecting something more, you know, more traditional quartet kind sure. of thing. So, mm -hmm. But it was really cool. And the audience was transfixed, Key. <laughs> That's good. I think what I heard uh, in the clip was actually the third movement of George Cortog's uh, C. Moment Musico, his Capriccio. Um, and at least for that movement, as the title suggests, it's a very capricious movement where things change very, very uh, quickly. Um, and it's supposed to be sort of a humorous movement. That must have been so interesting working on that kind of dynamic of sound, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, across countries and time zones. And 
Uh, oh, yeah. It, you know, must have been incredible. And I wonder, did you ever get annoyed with each other? Was he like, come on, you guys are, <laughs> you guys are the, you guys are, are not the composer. You know, what, what, I mean, we're, we're not on the air, so. Uh, no, actually, I mean, Cortog is, we, we had the opportunity to work with him at a Carnegie Hall workshop uh, back in 2011 or so. And he himself is so exacting. All right, stand by. Three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. And yes, that was the Parker Quartet. And they uh, were playing um, a Georg Cortage at Six Moments Musical. Um, and I was trying to get my head around that. The whole performance last night, I was watching it on YouTube. It's fascinating. The music is incredibly dynamic and interesting. Uh, very untraditional mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, as far as uh, sure. the, a quartet experience is, is concerned. I want to get back to that question, he about the the way you bring Beethoven, for example. You know, we talked a little mm -hmm. bit about your anniversary, which is 20 years of being a quartet together. You decided, let's do all 16 uh, quartet, the Beethoven quartets. We're going to do all 16. We're going to play them in two separate locations, one of which is going to be the annual festival for this sort of thing, which happens in Buffalo. Where else mm -hmm. are you performing the 16? Uh, so at the end of March, uh, we will be playing them, playing the 16 Beethoven quartets at the University of South Carolina. Uh, we've had a visiting residency with them for the past 10 years. And uh, as much to celebrate our connection with them, we'll be performing um, the Beethoven Cycle in, I believe, six concerts. And what's really interesting about that is uh, we'll be performing them at venues that were built around the time that Beethoven composed these quartets. So historical buildings in Columbia, South Carolina, that were built in the 1800s, early 1800s, stuff like that, too. So there should be a lot of uh, a sense of history uh, that sort of permeates the entire performance. How cool is that? That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And so untraditional locations. I wanted to ask you about that, you know, homeless sure. shelters and schools, et cetera. Sure. Yeah. So because we're playing these Beethoven, this Beethoven cycle, not in our home community, we still wanted uh, some sort of way to bring this music to our community uh, where we live, which is in the Boston metro area. And so instead of trying to set up yet another performance of the entire cycle, we thought, why don't we actually um, bring this to people who would not normally be exposed to this kind of um you know, quote, uh, art, art music, um, highbrow art music. And so uh, Jessica, our, our violist, has been very, very instrumental in making and forging these connections with um, community leaders and people who work at these institutions, such as youth centers and uh, hospitals and homeless shelters and stuff like that, too. And so uh, that should be a very interesting experience. And we really truly believe that great music really um, needs no needs no introduction and can uh, communicate some sort of deeper um, emotional content. Um, and so uh, we're very excited as to the impact this will have on these people. It definitely yeah. have, have an impact for sure. Um, and just another shout out, we just remind our listeners, I'm speaking with Ki Kim, one of the founding members of Grammy Award winning Parker Quartet. Uh, and they will be coming to our Santa Barbara Museum of Art at the Mary Craig Auditorium on November 21st, the evening at 7.30. And you can get your tickets at tickets.sbma.net, or you can call the Santa Barbara Museum of Art as well. And I just want to also say that this is, you know, part of the, part of the, <laughs> The, the quartet, what they do is they do a lot of traveling. And I was just amazed to, to, to read all the places that they've performed. They're coming back to Santa Barbara for their fourth performance with us. Um, it just shows you that we really have loved them over the years. Uh, and I wasn't just an interesting thing about Parker Quartet. 
the name. Okay, the Parker Quartet. How did they get their name? Well, everybody that's been to Boston knows the Parker House. That's the Boston Historic Landmark. You'll know it because it has the name Parker House Boston Cream Pie, Parker that's House right. Rolls, etc. And so we have the Parker Quartet because Parker, Parker Quartet's home is in New England, in Boston. And they pay homage to the great history of artists and writers who use the Parker House as a meeting point. And that just shows you, you know, when I'm researching the quartet for this interview, they, they're not limiting themselves to other musicians as far as their artistic connections. Mm -hmm. They are reaching out into the artistic community in general. You were just hearing Mr. Kim tell us that they were doing part of their new series with video artists. So, I mean, this is really a collaborative, um, forward thinking quartet. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, again, you know, the, the idea that they are bringing such mu musicians as Beethoven to areas that maybe you never have heard a, a quartet before. Um, mm -hmm. And then their new album just released, too. So a lot to talk about. Um, but do join us at the concert Monday, November 21st at 730. And like I say, you can hear... Well, I'll tell you what you're going to hear. Um, if I'm if I'm correct, uh, Key, you're doing mm -hmm. Caroline Shaw's Valencia, Leggetti's yep. Quartet Number no. Two, and mm -hmm. Beethoven's Quartet in E Flat Major, Opus One Two Seven. Yep. Okay. Well, we'll see yeah. you on November 21st. I know you're you're performing all throughout California this week, and so we'll see you Monday at, in Santa Barbara. Thank you so much Looking for being with us. It. You're looking forward to thank it, you, too. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sure, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Key. Bye. Okay, take care. Bye. Okay, Richard. So we're going to say goodbye to Mr. Key, but we're also, I want to do a quick shout out here. Um, The Ojai Film Festival. Yes, I go to quick break after this. I just have the little PSA here, Richard. The Ojai Film Festival reached out to me, and they want everybody to know they're doing a free screening this Saturday night. Uh, it's at Matillaha Auditorium at, in Ohio at 7 p.m. And it's a documentary that's made world headlines. It's called The Unredacted, <clears throat> formerly titled Jihab Rehab. Uh, it's premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, but it's only been shown at a couple other film festivals throughout the country because of its controversial nature. Um, the film follows three men each of who were detained for 15 years at the U.S. Naval Base at Guantanamo after their transfer to a rehabilitation fa faculty in Sa Saudi Arabia. Uh, the filmmaker Meg, Meg, Meg Smaker spent over a decade living and working in the Middle East, five years in Yemen. She learned Arabic. She studied Islam. She taught firefighting. The, this film came out of her experience, and she... Um, as she, let's see, she's oh, this documentary's won awards, the best sh short documentary at South by Southwest and in Student Academy <laughs> Award. She's going to present the event this coming, um, well, tomorrow, Saturday at 7 p.m. Uh, at, in Ojai at the Matillaha Auditorium. It's free. And then she'll present to give a little talk about how she put the documentary together. Um, and, and then we'll have the screening. But it, it's an important landmark because it's it's a, like I said it's a controversial film, and mm, Ohio's got the guts to do it. So I think that's a pretty amazing thing about our little film festival. So let's go to quick break, Richard, and then I want to introduce when we get back from the break. I want to introduce a new director for Solstice, one of our, our favorite former directors, is going to join us to talk a little bit about. What the what the plans are for Solstice? We're going to talk to, talk to Penny Little and Claudia Bratton when we get back from the break. Penny Penny's our new director. Claudia is a former director of Solstice. Always my favorite favorite holiday in Santa Barbara. Don't turn that down. Back in a minute.
And how are you today? I'm great. How are you? Good hat, Penny. I like the hat. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you need to sit still, though, I tell you. You're just jumping around way too much there. I know. I know. I'm, on Hi, my yoga. I'm on my yoga ball. <laughs> ah! <laughs> So there's Penny and Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for coming on. That's great. Yeah, and and um, Penny, I'm going to introduce you, and then you introduce Claudia. Okay. Okay. Great. And I yes, I want to talk about plans. You know what 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 you think is going to be new and exciting with solstice, what's traditional, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the things that we, we're, we're going to look forward to, the the themes that we're going to collaborate on with you, et cetera. You know, all of the all of the new uh, ideas and some of the tried and true ones, too. Yeah. Every time this this time of year where we start to think about solstice, Claudia, I remember uh, <laughs> you, you introducing me to Jay Paul. Do you remember yeah. the guy paraplegic? Yeah. yeah, and so that was a lifelong. Yeah, absolutely. He, he was such an inspiration to everybody in the workshop, and I would hold him up with that, you know, and say, "Look, you guys, here you are complaining, and look at what he's creating by himself. Give me, you know, <laughs> take some some looks and and do the right thing, you know." Yeah, that's right. So that was two. I think two thousand eight. You introduced us, and and um, I think I was like a I was a like a kind of a shell shocked person that had just moved to Santa Santa Barbara, and I didn't have any friends, didn't know anybody, and I thought, let me volunteer. And um, I can remember Jay Paul was holding. We're coming back. Okay. Three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart, and we just were discussing a, a beautiful concert that's going to take place at our Santa Barbara M Museum of Art, which is November the 21st. Um, and now we're going to switch gears entirely. Summer Solstice has a new executive director, Penny Little, and we're going to speak with Penny. And Penny said, look, I want to bring Claudia Bratton on as well. Claudia is a director when I moved to Santa Barbara of, of uh, Solstice and a, a committed artist in our community, et cetera. So um, Claudia is here as well. And I want to talk a little bit at first. I want to introduce Penny to everybody. Um, she is an arts lover, supporter. She understands. She's a good communicator, et cetera. Um, it's, uh, this is an a executive director position, but she's been involved with Solstice for 15 years. I've seen her around. She wants to do um, all kinds of new things, but she's got some <laughs> old projects to work on here, day-to-day -day operations, parade and festival logistics, fundraising, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. We already had, I think it was October 15th, we had a gathering um, also. So there's going to be a few other things happening like that. This is a unique thing. Solstice is so unique because it's, it's a Santa Barbara thing. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's just, it's our own thing. And it's just so unique. I, I was saying to Penny last night, I was bitten with the solstice bug in 2008 when I was in the parade with Jay Paul and the guy in a wheelchair. And there comes my accountant in a little blue Speedo and nothing else. And I thought when my accountant can show up in a blue Speedo, I'm in the right place. Um, Penny holds a BA in film and music from Sagamon State University in Springfield, Illinois. She's produced and directed a lot of documentary films. She's toured as a professional singer and songwriter. She has extensive experience in event organizations. She's worked for Beautiful Dying Expo Advisory, Inspire Pop-Ups, Gale and VP Receptions for Art, the Awaken Film Festival, Boston Media Summit, Santa Barbara Democracy Festival, et cetera, Peace Congress, et cetera. Lots of, lots of wonderful experience to bring to the position. Ricardo Morrison said, um, I'm sure she'll keep us inspired and engaged, which indeed she will. 
she succeeds Executive Director Robert Ellender, who assumed the role in 2016. Um, and so I've introduced Penny Little and Penny, gosh, we're excited to have you at the helm. Would you introduce your friend, Claudia? Well, thank you so much. Uh, my friend and colleague, Claudia Bratton, I worked with her from 2000, 2006 until 2015, and I was her assistant. And so I, it was it's such an honor to have worked with her. And we are working together again because she's doing the junior artist program and we're planning a white party. We used to have this white ball. And so she can probably talk a little bit about the white ball, but that's coming up December 14th. And we're just kind of getting that off the ground right now because it's so important to get together with the community. And that's why I did the October 15th thing, you know, to bring, keep bringing the community together and reminding us all about how important the arts and how important solstice is because it's part of the DNA of this community. I mean, it's like, it's one of the reasons why Santa Barbara is such a great place to be and to live. And so it is just my pleasure to have Claudia in on this call as well. <laughs> I, I have to tell you that white party, I'm so excited that that is uh, going to be a thing again. I uh, remember being at, I think it was 2008 or nine. I can't remember what year, but I was at the white party. And here, Claudia, you have to, you'll laugh about this. So you actually, I was looking back in the archives of, you know, my relationship with Solstice to kind of prepare for this talking. You said, uh, um, uh, you emailed me a picture of me, I think. Um, and I believe I was with your sister or something. We were in in the, we were at the white party, and you said, "Oh, Elizabeth, you were the belle of the ball." And you were referring to the fact that I went out thrift store hunting for the biggest, poofiest wedding gown, white wedding gown I could find. Huge. The skirt was, you know, twelve feet across. It was huge. <laughs> I could hide somebody underneath there, and you know, I wore that thing in a white wig, and I brought my my best pal, I dressed him in all white as well. Um, I brought my son and my, and my future daughter-in-law. We were all dressed in white. Jay Paul met us. And uh, it was a fantastic evening. And the history of that dress. So my best pal um, for 36 years or so is Native American. Um, and we're, he's an artist. We met because he was an artist. And he said to me a couple of years later, do you have that gown? I said, yeah, I, I mean, it's in storage. My daughter's getting married. She's your size. And she loved the picture that Claudia took of us. She wants to wear that gown at her wedding. So I sent her, I mean, it cost me lots of money to send. The thing was so big, but I sent her the gown and she was married in that same gown that made its appearance at the white ball. So I'm so excited the white ball is coming back. But that's such a cool thing. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, Claudia, take it away. I'm going to grab a, a hot cup of coffee. Talk for a minute while I get a coffee. Okay. Well, we're really happy to have the, the, the white party come back. And it's going to be at Anchor Rose, which is at the Maritime Museum. It used to be called Endless Summer. And it's going to be a really lovely evening. And we'll have food and beverages and... Um, we're going to have a wonderful silent auction like we've had in the past. And it's a lot of fun and you can get great gifts, you know, kind of right at the right time. And um, one of the other things that I am, I did this last year and I'm going to even be doing larger this coming year is the junior artist program, because I feel it's so important to reach out to young people and get more young people involved. And so um, my daughter is teaching art at Bishop Diego High School. So I will have a nice in there. And we had about 10 kids that participated this last year and I raised money so I gave each one of them a check varying in amounts according to their participation but we also will have Carlos Cuellar so that we can have a bunch of Latino students and we will have you know bilingual people working with us and it's great they learn how to make masks they learn how to sew okay one year we had some girls junior artists that came in and they lived in Carpinteria and they they we're taught how to sew. It's great. Anyway, and 
building the building trades can actually be taught to building floats, you know. So it's it's a really fun, good thing, and I'm raising money for it. Anyway, so if, if people okay, so now we're we're going to talk turkey. So if people want to give money to that project, Claudia, how, how do they get in touch? Um, they should get in touch with solsticeparade.com and they can. Uh, I think there's a donate donate button on the site that they can go ahead and donate, and they could put you know a little for junior artist program. Very good. Okay, Richard's giving us a sign. Got to go to quick break. Just reintroducing, you know, I'm talking with Penny Little. She's our new executive director for Solstice. And she is also kind enough to bring with her for our interview today, Claudia Bratton, who was her mentor for years. Uh, she was the assistant to Claudia, who was the director for many, many years of Solstice. And, and what, what a good time uh, that was in, in, in my life, too. And, and some of the things that, you know, we over the pandemic had to forego, you know, solstice is it's just such an important thing. It just was a big hole <laughs> in that particular month. It was like, oh, <laughs> so, but we're, we're, you know, we will be doing some fun stuff and the white ball is coming back and that's going to be in a great location, December 15th. Um, the young artist program is going to be huge and you can donate um, and we're not just talking people with paints. We're talking people that build things that, you know, make the floats, for example. So you can be a young artist that who is a young budding carpenter or electrician, for example. Um, you know, physics guy. I mean, I remember that one physics guy who built that one um, float one year. It was like, my God, you're an engineer, physician, a, a phys you know, what do you want to say? Um, um, a build a building engineer, but also he was defying physics in my mind. So you know, you get some people like this. That imagine a young person that is going to mentor under somebody like that. That's what Claudia is putting together now. Hey, Richard, let's go to quick break. Get back from the break. A few more. Let's tell a few stories, favorite stories about solstice. I'd love to hear what you guys you have in your in because you've been around with the solstice for a long time. So the the fun people, the fun floats, the fun, the fun parties, the interesting things, the near disasters, all these things I'd love to hear when we get back from the break. Don't turn that down. Back with Claudia and Penny. All right, you're clear. So glad you're on the call, Claudia. <laughs> You know what? I think we should tell a funny story about when we were just the week of solstice and everything was so intense and the phones. And remember, you ran into the office and you went, oh, do you have anybody in gibberish? We remember tell that? that story. And then I answered in gibberish. And we understood each other. <laughs> we yeah, understood you each other. Story. Yeah. That was the <laughs> I don't want to talk about near disasters. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the, the only near disaster would be the heart attack at the winter white ball, remember? Because it had a wonderful ending, you know? It did, yes. You can yeah. tell that story, too. Um, I didn't know ball. about that. Oh, yeah. Um, some friends of mine drove up for the winter white ball, and um, she said to me, oh, Doug's not feeling well. And I, I said, well, is he coming down with the flu or something? And she goes, well, no, he's kind of got chest pain and he's sweaty. Oh, God. And so she said, is uh, Dr. Bob here, who was a real doctor and a friend of mine? And I said, hang on. So I ran and got him. And he, um, the guy was then on the floor at the towards the end of the bar. And anyway, um, Bob had the bartender called 911 and anyway we just I laid on the right down on the floor next to him and I said come on Doug we're gonna breathe we're breathing we're breathing and Bob Dr. Bob was there and then the ambulance came and the fireman and then at one point because this man was very hairy and they needed to put the leads for the EKG on him they shaved his chest I said oh the 40 year old virgin all over again <laughs> <laughs> which made everybody we it was the comic relief we all needed in that moment <laughs> and what year was Mark that Edmonds radio really oh probably 2012 mm. yeah mm -hmm. 
Yeah, 2012 or 2013, yeah. Yeah, somewhere in there, yeah. And the good news, the final, the rest of the story is he's perfectly healthy now. He, he they unblocked his heart in 45 minutes. It was called the Widowmaker. And he's much healthier than he's ever been in his life 10 years later. That's great. All right, we're coming back. In three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. And just that, you know, you, you, you're you hearing that wonderful um, string quartet music. That's just, a, that was our previous um, interview. This is the Parker Quartet is coming to the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And that's a November 21st. This is their fourth appearance. They're so beloved here that they're coming back for their fourth appearance. And I'm talking with Summer Solstice new executive director, Penny Little, and her good friend and my friend too, Claudia Bratton, who was with Solstice for years and years. And she's still the in, involved. I understand she's putting together the white ball again. It must it must do event just to see the just to see the costumes that people come up with. Uh, and I asked both both gals if they would tell me some of their favorite favorite solstice stories. So, uh, Penny, how about you? Do you have a favorite? I have a lot of favorites. I but, bet. Um, I remember the the actual first time I saw the parade after I'd worked with Solstice for maybe four years. And I was at the VIP area. And it was the first time I actually got to rest and actually watch the whole parade go by. And I sat down and there were tears of joy streaming down my face. I couldn't believe how amazing and how wonderful all this was. And I, you know, put this energy into this thing logistically and otherwise. And I was just so aw awed because we do this for people. We bring them so much joy, but my joy was overwhelming because I really hadn't had the opportunity to see the results of all the work that I had been involved in. The team of us, all of us people doing this here in Santa Barbara. I mean, it was amazing to me. And um, because I was always so busy, I didn't get to watch it. <laughs> so yeah, that that's one of my, I think that's a highlight for me. It, it's funny because if you're in the parade, you don't realize the, the, the depth of creativity that's, you know, because you're right in the parade. So you're not, you know, you're not completely realizing, you know, how, how, how cool it is. So a couple of years, I, I just was on the sidelines, just watching, 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 just so I could see, you know, the, the miles of creativity, miles of creativity passing by. Oh, okay, Claudia, how about, a, I mean, you probably have a basket of, of stories. Oh, I do. But I'll tell a funny one about Penny and I, just like the week of solstice when it's just really intense and the phones are ringing and people are coming in and needing stuff. Penny came running into my office and she just started talking gibberish. You know, and so I just answered her in gibberish and we both started laughing hysterically because we both understood what the other one said. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we got it done. Hey, yeah. Richard, Richard. Yes, Elizabeth. H have you ever been, you've, you've seen Solstice, right? Uh, I still remember my very first Solstice, and it was before we moved here. And I remember <clears throat> that it went on and on. And then all of a sudden, I saw this giant inflated ball that looked like the sun. And I'm going, what the heck? And then there were more people behind the ball. Yeah, that was Polly X Mano. Polly does that. People inflatable. Yeah. They get to become part of the parade uh, as the parade comes to an end. Yep. That was. Yep. It was. It was. It was one of. But my favorite, my absolute favorite float, if you will, was this pup tent. And there were people inside, but it was zipped up, and it would move down the street, and it would stop, and then it would shake. <laughs> And then it would rise up and then move along. I remember. What mm -hmm. the heck is that? And then it dawned on me. And actually, uh, uh, my wife told me, oh, they're telling ghost stories inside the tent. <laughs> and I well, thought, that is some creativity in action. That was cool. Oh, well, that's a, a PC way to say it, Richard. But there's probably other activities going on. In the tent. But at any rate. <laughs> 
I, I tell you my favorite costume. This was one year where everybody was incredibly creative and doing these incredibly over, you know, overscale, wonderful things. And a young college guy, this was his first solstice. He couldn't get his friends together, so he came by himself. He had a, a can of um, green theatrical paint, and he did his whole body, and he had his little green Speedos on. And then he thought, oh, wait a minute, I'm just a green person. So he stopped and cut down somebody's bush and got in the middle of the bush and wore the bush down State Street <laughs> as a bush. And it, it was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> uh, now, before we go to break here, uh, let me, I don't know which one to toss this to Claudia or Penny, but the, the, one, the rule is that uh, there can be nothing, uh, I guess, motorized. Uh, in other words, this is all, um, oh, I guess in the, to, to coin a musical phrase, it's all acoustic, so to speak. <laughs> So what are the what are the what are the rules? Not so much the prohibitions, but I mean, what are the rules in terms of your participation? Whether you have a float, you're dragging a wagon behind you, because there are no vehicles involved. No, oh, what do Richard, I do? no motors. Richard, Richard, let's go to quick break because okay. I want I want to have enough time for Claudia to answer that. Yeah, let's go to quick break. We'll be right back with the new director for Solstice, Penny Little, and Claudia Bratton, her good friend. Long years of involvement, both of these gals with Solstice. Don't turn that down. Back in a minute. All right, you're clear. That was one wild Solstice that I saw, and it had to have been like, I don't know, 2000, 99 or 2000 or something like that. Uh, you know, but it was yeah. it was one of the wildest things I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought, wow, this is this is one crazy town. <laughs> yeah. and all to celebrate one guy's birthday amazing yeah 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 it it, it is it's, it's amazing and that's going to be 50 years very soon right i want to talk about the historical museum thing because for the 50th anniversary they're going to make a big deal about it and yeah. it's, it's kind of like but uh, that's that's not this year it's the following year well, yeah, it's a falling year that we're planning a big thing in, in the 50th anniversary, not this year, not 2023, but 2024, we're planning a big, big 50th anniversary thing. So we maybe tell, tell that one next year. <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean, it, it kind of says that we're moving what we're doing for the future. I mean, we are working on that right now and the oral, oh, the oral histories. We want people who were involved from early on to do the oral histories. And I'm reaching out to different people that the history museum for that event in 2024 are looking to have the archive of the oral histories. They're planning a big exhibit. Hopefully we'll get a few better artifacts in there than what we have. Um, but anyway, it's it, they're, they're gonna really be promoting something that year. But the oral histories are something I'm reaching out to people for right now. Okay, I'll shut up. I wonder if there's a connection, you know, um, I was a, 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 um, an older graduate student when I went back for my PhD, I was an older graduate student and, uh, you know, I, I occasionally I'll come and um, do teaching assistance uh, positions at the university and the city college. If we said to the, you know, history department, what students needed a, a, a thesis top topic or dissertation topic? Or what group of students? I imagine you'd have an oral history project, you know, done as part of their coursework. What a great idea! Mm -hmm. I mean, because I want other people to do all these things. By the way, not me. <laughs> exactly. Well, no, but there's there's yeah, exactly. There's... You want to engage people in the community, the people that have passion about a particular thing. Uh, stand by. We're coming back in three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart and celebrating, well, obviously celebrating Solstice, but the the new executive director, Penny Little, is here with um, her former mentor, Claudia Bratton. And Richard had a question for Claudia. Uh, 
what are the rules? Uh, Richard knows that it's an analog. In other words, there's no motorized vehicle, but what are right. the rules? That's the main thing. There's no motorized vehicles and there's also some height restrictions, um, but that's it. And then we we do have, you know, uh, some clothing um, required in certain areas. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> and no words. Yeah, no words, no signs, no symbols. Yeah, that that goes back to the very first parade when Michael Gonzalez went for a permit, and they thought he it was during the Great Boycott, and they thought he was going to have a, you know, some sort of a boycott march. So they, the city said no signs, no, no symbols, no words, and of course he was a mime. Okay, mimes don't need words, signs, or symbols. <laughs> Right. And so the, it, uh, just just to refresh our memory, how many people come? How long is the parade? How many people participate? You know, how, what are the rules for joining at the workshop? All right. Who wants to take this one? Um, well, you know, our average has been 90,000 to 100,000 people see the parade and 60,000 people come. We're coming to the three day festival that was pre COVID. And so now we're in a position of building back people coming back to events. But I heard all kinds of really high estimates about all the people on Santa Barbara Street. I heard everything, you know, up to 70,000. And so it was really a, a successful event for the community. And everyone was really hungry for this parade to be back. You could tell because there was such excitement about it. And so if, if people want to volunteer and, and help at the workshop. How did they okay. do it? What they, they can come in, okay, and we do uh, remind them to wear clothing that can get paint on it. You'd be surprised. And we also have this closed toe shoe thing so that when people drop things, they don't hurt themselves. But you can volunteer, in which case we have you work for, you know, a certain time. And then you're free to then start creating whatever you want for the parade we also most people come in and pay a small fee to um be in the workshop and it helps cover the cost of the materials uh the the you know the tools that we have to replace every year the wood the screws the fabrics uh the paints etc so um it's it's great and there's you know uh, adults pay more than kids and all of that so and then, you know, from that, there's usually around a thousand people that end up being in the parade. Some people come the day of the parade and register then. We uh, raise the price on registration a few days before the parade because it's easier for us if we know how many people are going to be there and what they're doing. So we can make it as cohesive as possible. And how many people per uh, are, are paraders? I have right now. 1,000, 1,200, it depends on the year. Um, 1,000. At mm -hmm. least. And the, the workshop will open again in 2023 in May and run all the way through the day of the parade. And so people can just go down to the workshop once it's open. Before that, they can go to our website, solsticeparade.com, and keep you know, sign up for our newsletter because that'll keep people apprised of what's actually going on in the community. And we're promoting all these different arts events in the community that we're involved in, too. So there's all these kinds of happenings. Like Fantastic. Well, thank you, Penny. Thank you, Claudia. Long live solstice. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. All right. You're clear. Thank you. And okay, uh, let's so have some fun out there. Yeah, exactly. So let, let I'll send you guys, I'll send you the <clears throat> the link to this. And then uh, Penny, you can use it on the website. I mean, if um, right. you know, obviously you cut cut out the chamber music folks at the beginning, but if you if you want to cut it, if you want to use any part of it on the website, you can. It's you know, it's yours. So okay. um, 